My name is Matt Zwolinski. I'm a professor here in the uh, Department of Philosophy and also the director of the Center for Ethics, Economics, and Public Policy, which is sponsoring tonight's debate, uh, along with the Institute for Entrepreneurship and Education, the School of uh, Education here. Um, I'm going to say a few words uh, about the topic of tonight's debate and uh, about the uh, distinguished individuals we have to uh, conduct this conversation. Uh, but before I do that, uh, we're very grateful to have uh, President of the University of San Diego, uh, Dr. Jim Harris, uh, who is going to say a few words uh, before we get started. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our guests from off campus. Uh, Dr. Zolinski, uh, thank you for inviting me here this evening. I want to start off by commending the work of the Center for Ethics, Economics, and Public Policy and thanking those of you like Malin who have supported this uh, so much over the last few years and making this new center a reality. The center represents a collaboration between the College of Arts and Sciences and the School of Business, and its mission is grounded in civil dialogue and the free exchange of ideas. Now, these principles, I believe, are at the heart of what the university is all about. And if you go back to our founding with Bishop Charles Buddy and Mother Rosalie Hill, they envisioned a university on the Hill as a beacon of light for the Catholic intellectual tradition, and where free inquiry is enriched by the contributions of all religions, all cultures, and points of view. And as an engaged contemporary Catholic university, we not only tolerate, but we welcome the creative tensions that exist when considering a full range of competing viewpoints on crucial matters faced by our society. And our faculty at USD are critical thinkers who empower our students to explore questions thoughtfully as they search out the truth in all areas and from all sources. Now we have something we call the culture of care on campus as well that encourages us to move outside of our own comfort zones to demonstrate empathy as we seek to understand the world around us. We do this by recognizing the multiple lenses and life experiences that shape a wide range of opinions and views. With this at our foundation, we engage in dialogue that reflects the highest standards of conduct, mutual respect, and a commitment to the dignity of all people. This is at the heart of what a university should provide for students, and forums like this enable us to expose our students to competing viewpoints, which helps all of you to think critically about what really matters and what really works when it comes to making the world a better place. We're all well aware of the intensifying political uh, polarization that we have in the United States, and our sense of common community has been framed for a number of years. To many, they believe we're descending further and further into incivility and intolerance in ways that have been unseen in American politics for decades. We're on, they, we understand that extreme partisanship, and particularly the uh, demonization of those that we oppose, is destructive to our democracy, and we also know that a house divided cannot stand against itself. But I remain the house optimist because I work with students on a daily basis. And I believe that this generation actually is, will be better equipped in the long run to collectively work uh, with their fellow citizens to rebuild the foundations of civility. Therefore, I believe there's never been a more necessary time for universities to take up a leadership role in an effort to rebuild the civility of our national dialogue and our common sense of community. The process of change begins today with listening and constructively engaging with one another. Debates like these are wonderful models for our students of what an intelligent, respectful disagreement looks like on important questions of public policy. I'd like to thank the center, and I'd like to thank Dr. Zolinski for his leadership on our campus, as well as our distinguished panelists for being with us today. And I'm sure this is going to be an exciting exchange and respectful exchange of ideas. I look forward to future forums like these that provide opportunities for understanding and reflecting upon the multiple perspectives beyond our own. And I'm confident that these forums will benefit our students, the San Diego community, and our region. So enjoy tonight's debate. Thank you for being here. Our topic tonight is school choice. It's a controversial idea that promises either to revitalize our nation's educational system or undermine it, depending on whom you ask. The basic idea is simple. Allow parents to take the money that the government would have spent on educating their child in public school and use that money to pay for private school tuition instead. 
Current Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos is a fan of the idea and hopes to expand the currently small number of school choice programs in the United States, but the idea is not without its critics. Tonight, we're going to take a deep dive into the arguments both for and against school choice. Does school choice offer the promise of a better quality of education for America's students? And is it compatible with the American ideals of fairness, equality of opportunity, and democratic control? We are very fortunate tonight to be joined by two of the nation's leading experts on this topic. Terry Moe is the William Bennett Murnro Professor of Political Science at Stanford University and your senior fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. He is the author of, among numerous other books, Politics, Markets, and America's Schools, which with John Chubby published in 1990 and which revolutionized American thinking about school choice. And more recently, he is the author of Special Interest, Teachers Unions and America's Public Schools. Harry Brighouse is Professor of Philosophy, the Carol Dixon Bascom Professor of the Humanities and Affiliate Professor of Educational Policy Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. In 2000, he published a terrifically insightful book uh, entitled School Choice and Social Justice. And more recently with Adam Smith, he is the author uh, Swift, rather. Uh, he, <laughs> Adam Swift isn't, Smith isn't writing much these days. Um, with Adam Swift, he is the author of Family Values, The Ethics of Parent-Child Relationships, uh, a book which I think we'll see has uh, much more closely connected with tonight's topic than you might expect. Uh, we have built tonight's conversation as a debate. And indeed, I think we're going to see significant disagreements between uh, the two individuals that we brought together on important issues of public policy. But there's a sense in which debate is a kind of misleading way of describing what we're trying to do here tonight. Uh, the point of tonight's event is not to see who wins uh, by persuading the greatest number of people to join their side or scoring rhetorical points. Rather, the point is to engage in something that's, I think, too often lacking in today's political discourse, a genuine conversation where the aim is not to defeat the other side, but to understand it, to know better why intelligent people can disagree with you about an important topic, uh, and thereby hopefully to bring a little bit more respect and humility into our own lives and into public discourse. So without any further ado, let's get to tonight's event. Uh, our format tonight, we're going to have short opening statements from uh, both our participants here, about 10 minutes each, explaining what they think about school choice and why. Uh, after that, we're going to break into a conversational phase where I will ask uh, the participants questions, they'll ask each other questions, and hopefully we'll bring out a little bit more depth into these ideas. Uh, that'll go until about 7 o'clock or so, uh, and at 7 o'clock we'll open things up to questions and answer from the audience and let that go for about a half an hour. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn things over to, I didn't tell which of these individuals I'm going first, I said I'd do a mental coin flip, so I think the answer is, uh, Terry Mo. let's hear from you first, please. Right. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, you know, school choice um, uh, has been around for a long time. And uh, one of the reasons it's been so central to our national conversation is that we've been trying to reform the public schools since 1983, a nation at risk. You know, and here we are, it's 2017, and we're still talking about reforming the public schools. This is pretty pathetic, right? Um, but we keep trying. And the reason is that um, our existing system really isn't educating kids, giving them the quality education that they deserve. You know, take a look at how the U.S. does compared to other countries on international tests. You know, most recently we came in 35th, unbelievable, on, on math. This is, you know, it's always been embarrassing, but it just gets more embarrassing every year, right? So our kids are not only not learning what they need to learn, our country is becoming less and less competitive internationally. Uh, this is a really big deal that we have an education system that can't perform. So what are we going to do about it? Well, I, I think that School choice has a lot to contribute, um, and that it really needs to be central to our discussions about education reform. So 
why do I think uh, school choice has something to offer? Well, two advantages stand out. One is that it simply provides options to families. Right now, well-to-do families don't need options. Affluent people will always find good schools, right? They can move to good school districts. They can send their kids to private schools. They have no problems. If there are bad schools out there, who are the kids that are going to be in those schools? They're all going to be disadvantaged kids, always. And if you look at urban areas which are filled with disadvantaged kids, minorities, Many of those schools are very low performing schools, very troubled schools. And so what those kids need are options. They need alternatives to these schools that they're essentially trapped in. They are forced to go to schools that aren't educating them. Big picture, these schools are ruining their lives. A lot of these kids are going to wind up in prison or dead we're simply in dead-end jobs. This is a travesty, and it's been going on for decades and decades. These kids need options. And the standard response is, no, you just stay in, stay in those schools, and we're going to fix those schools. Well, they were saying that 30 years ago. Did they fix those schools? You know, just how good are the schools in Detroit? They've been trying to fix those schools for 30 years. That's the way it's gone. Those kids need options, and they need them now. And that's where school choice comes in. School choice, if it's done right, and it isn't always done right, is a way of empowering people who don't have choice. Right? Everybody else, the affluent, they have choice. Money is choice. The poor don't have choice. This is a, truly a way of empowering them and getting them out of these schools that are ruining their lives. All right, the second thing is that choice changes the incentives. Precisely because parents can leave bad schools and seek out better schools, that changes the incentives of everybody in schools, who, the people who run the schools. They know that if they don't perform, if they're not responsive, if they don't educate those kids, they can lose money and lose kids and lose jobs. They don't want that to happen. And that changes their incentives. It puts performance at the center of their incentives. Right? This hasn't been true historically in the American education system. Choice brings performance to center stage. This is a huge deal. Again, this is if it's done right. But if it's done right, it can be very powerful. All right. Now, choice is usually associated with conservatives, you know, right-wingers, you know, and that's not an accident, right? Milton Friedman, a free market economist in the 1950s, uh, originated the idea of vouchers, and since then, uh, choice, vouchers, uh, uh, have been associated uh, with conservatives. But the first great victory that choice achieved was in 1990 with the Milwaukee Voucher Program. And what happened in Milwaukee was that the poor people there, lo and behold, stood up and said, we can't take it anymore. These schools are terrible. We want out. We want vouchers. And they allied themselves with the Republican governor there, and they got themselves a pilot program, voucher program, only for poor kids. That program is now big, over 20,000 kids. But the point is that at that juncture, the voucher movement took a turn to the left. And it's not about free markets. It's for many people in the voucher movement. It's all about equality. It's about promoting social justice for those children who need it. And ever since then, almost all choice programs that have been adopted have been targeted at low-income, disadvantaged minority kids and disabled kids. There's a reason for that. At about that time, the first charter school was created in Minnesota. 
this was not a conservative idea, but it was sort of a response to vouchers, right? The left was freaked out about vouchers and the unions were, and charter schools were sort of a public school option, right, for choice. Well, okay, charter schools then sort of took off, relatively speaking, and became the growth area within the choice movement. And today, it's mainly all about charters. You know, you hear a lot of talk about vouchers, but today, 6% of the kids in this country are in charter schools, and something like 375,000 kids go to school on a voucher or through tax credits, right? So uh, charters are pretty much where it's happening. Uh, so this choice movement looks very different from the kind of thing that Milton Friedman envisaged, and the people who are driving it are not just right-wing nuts, no, right-wing activists, free market types. It includes a lot of people who represent minorities, who speak for the poor, who want to empower the poor, who promote charter schools, and who do not believe in free markets. All right, so. The way to think about the way choice um, gets adopted around the country is not in terms of free markets at all, but in terms of what I'll call a mixed market. Now think about the way, excuse me, a mixed model. So think about the way our economy works. Do we have a free market economy? No, right? We have markets, but the markets are embedded in a governmental framework uh, that consists of all kinds of rules, right? About for consumer protection, for the protection of labor, about pollution, all kinds of things that constrain how markets can operate, right? And it's the combination of the two that is our economy. It's a mixed model. And so the way to think about school choice is exactly that way. The kind of system that we have now is basically an extreme institutional system. It's a governmentally run system, top down, a bureaucratic system in which we put all our eggs in that basket. Right? The free market is at the other end of the continuum. Very few people are advocating a free market in schools. Right? We have a top-down system. And what most choice advocates are in favor of is just moving toward the center and having a mixed model, as we do in the economy. And the way it would work is that we would say, OK, we're going to have some schools of choice, hopefully lots of schools of choice. But those schools are going to be embedded in a democratically imposed framework that requires of them that they meet certain standards. There will be accountability. There will be audits, right? And perhaps other things like parent information centers to make sure that parents get informed. And provisions that require, for instance, that charter schools be closed when they don't perform sets of rules that are designed to guarantee as much as possible that markets work the way we want them to work. This is not creating a market system, right? This is using markets to social advantage and constraining the way they work, right? That's what happens in the economy and that's what we can do and have been trying to do uh, with choice. Right, so the whole thing about free markets is just a misnomer. That's not the way the thing is, is working, and that's not the way people are approaching it in politics. Okay, so the problem in all of this is that it is political. All these things get adopted through the political process. And the political process is not just driven by people sitting around thinking, gee, what would be best for kids? Anybody who knows anything about politics knows that is not the way it works. Politics is about power and it's about interests. And so if you come along and you say, you know, we should have more choice in the political, in the education system. Let's let kids leave the regular public schools and go to these choice schools because it would be good. They'd have options. Well, there are important players that don't like that. The unions don't like it and the school districts don't like it. And it's not because they're bad people, it's just because it's against their interests, right? So 
if kids move from regular public schools to charter schools, let's say, money goes with them and jobs go, go with them. Well, the unions don't want that. They, their members teach in the regular public schools. The districts don't want that. They don't want to lose money in kids. And so they're opposed to choice. They try to stop it as much as they can. And even if we could show 100% that choice was great for kids, and that they would learn so much more in choice schools, the unions and almost all districts would still oppose them and use their power in politics to stop them. And that's why, after more than 20 years, between 20 and 30 years of battle, only 6% of the kids are in charters. It's because power is ranged against them, and it has nothing to do with their performance. All right, so I don't want to go on and on, but if I have a few more minutes, okay. So there are some arguments against choice, um, many of them, more than I can cover here. So let me just talk about a few of them. Uh, one of them, uh, the most common one is, wow, choice drains money out of the public school system. Uh, and my response is, yes, it does. Uh, it also takes kids out of the public school system, and the public schools don't have to educate those kids, right? So why should they get paid for kids that they're not educating? The other schools should get paid for those kids. This is not brain surgery, right? This, this is straightforward, and uh, it only drains money out that the public schools don't need because they don't have to educate those kids. Now, there are considerations of fixed costs and so on that need to be taken into account, but these things can be worked out. OK, a second one. Choice leads to greater segregation and inequality. The first point to be made is this system that we have now is segregated. Go to any urban area. This system that we have now is grossly unequal and perpetuates inequality. Because these disadvantaged kids are not getting educated, they're being doomed. And so we need to do something about that. This is a fight for equality. And using a mixed model and imposing the right kinds of constraints on schools, like you can't select your, your children. That's a major rule. You know, in, in almost all these choice systems, the schools can't, can't choose their kids. They have to take them, take everybody that comes in the door, and then there's a lottery, right? There are rules that can be imposed, including informing parents, dragging parents into the schools, and so on, to make sure that all kids get the best possible shot at all schools, right? So if, if the framework is dedicated to promoting equality, you can do that. Okay. A third one, parents are bad choosers. <sighs> some parents are bad choosers, no doubt about it. There, there are some sandbaggers out there, right? Lots of kids are stuck. Some kids don't even have parents, right? They have guardians. There are kids who r desperately need help. Other parents, you know, they try, but they just make bad choices. Okay, but. Most parents are on this. Most parents care about the quality of the schools. And then it's the government's job through this framework to set up parent information centers, to have staff people whose job it is to reach out to every single family and check out their situation, talk to the guardians, make sure that those kids get in schools that are appropriate for them. This can happen. It has happened in some districts around the country. It can be built into the framework. So you don't just throw your hands up and say, oh, gee, parents are, are, are not good decision makers. You can do something about that. OK, and finally, um, there's the criticism that, well, choice just doesn't work. Look at the social science. OK, um, this is pretty complicated, and we can talk about it forever. Uh, uh, social science is complicated. Social science is a mess, basically. right? Anybody who's a social scientist knows it very well. Um, and in almost any area of social science, if you say, well, the findings are mixed, you'll be right, right? 
uh, it doesn't matter what the subject is. So uh, in this case, however, what I would say is that uh, if you look at the most rigorous studies, the ones that are done uh, through experiments, which are possible with uh, charters and with voucher schools, um, uh, the results are actually pretty positive on the whole. Um, and what I would suggest is that uh, for charter schools, uh, take a look at uh, recent studies that have been done by Credo, C-R-E-D-O, which is uh, based at Stanford. They're a highly respected organization. Uh, their latest studies are very positive about how charters do uh, relative to other public schools. But that doesn't mean that there aren't some bad charter schools out there. But some of this comes down to design, right? There are some states that just don't have rules in place to shut down bad charter schools, but you can do that. And they should do that. Okay, vouchers. Remember, vouchers are a small part of the picture here. But if you wanna know all the studies, rigorous studies that have been done on vouchers, take a look at uh, a review of all the evidence, of all the rigorous studies uh, just published uh, by Pat Wolf in the Peabody Journal of Education, 2017. Uh, he lists all the studies. And the results are uh, mixed, but on the whole, positive. Um, uh, and uh, it's not just academic uh, performance. We're talking about high school graduation and college attendance. And also, there are uh, quite a number of studies that show that when choice is present, it actually has a positive impact on the performance of the public school uh, students through competitive effects. So, um, in my view, uh, the arguments against choice are like totally legitimate. Uh, you know, I mean, these are concerns that should be raised. We should talk about them. Uh, we need to get serious about them and recognize. See, I think this is what critics do normally, um, is they say, oh, well, choice drains money out of the public school system and therefore choice is bad, so it's over. Uh, choice is, we're not gonna support choice. What they should say is, what can we do about this? How can we adjust this so that it works, right? And that's what the framework is for. So uh, I'm wrapping it up here. Um, so I think that uh, what almost everyone in the choice movement is, is trying to achieve is a mixed model where we have something that doesn't replace the public school system, it adds choice to the public school system. And I think we should have a public school system that has regular public schools and, oops, and charter schools and voucher schools and let parents choose, let, let them decide. And if the public schools, the regular public schools actually do a better job than charter schools and voucher schools, people will go there. You know, and let people sort themselves and move across these schools as they see fit there should be no fixed number, no fixed size in any sector, and let them just adjust. Because in the end, what matters is what's best for children. We're not trying to preserve a system. This is not about a system, right? This is about children and finding schools that are best for them. Okay, thank you. All right, now we'll bring up uh, Professor Brighouse. Thanks. So when Matt invited me to debate on school choice, I said, oh, good, that'd be nice. Um, what side do you think I'll be on? Uh, and he said, oh, I think you'll be against. And I thought, yeah, that's kind of a relief because I'm slightly more comfortable on that side. Um, uh, um, when I'm not a diehard opponent of school choice, and as you'll see, I, I support some programs, including some of the programs that, that, that Terry's mentioned. Um, uh, but w when it turned out that as a consequence of this, I was going to be debating Terry, I, my feelings were mixed. On the one hand, sort of uh, um, brilliant uh, to meet and converse with someone whose work uh, has been informing my own thinking for so many years. Um, on the other hand, do I disagree with him enough? to really make it a debate? Yeah, probably. Um, 
So my initial comments have got sort of three interwoven themes. So one is some theoretical reasons for doubting that school choice can really harness the choices of parents to make schooling equitable and efficient. Um, then thoughts about the evidence on actually existing programs, and then some comments about other reforms. And I think you know maybe the message is that the, my biggest reservation about school choice is that I think it, dis, discussions of school choice, like the ones we're having, crowd out discussions of other kinds of reforms that I think we need. And in particular, I worry that discussions of school choice let politicians off the hook who, want to, uh, who don't want to uh, implement the kinds of policies that I think uh, low-income children really need in order to uh, um, improve their education. So the first, I'm just going to sort of go through my comments. First is about equity. If we really care about equity, we cannot rely on school choice. Parents are inevitably and reasonably primarily motivated by benefiting their own children. And parents with better information, more time in education and cultural capital, and more money will use their choice-making powers uh, to get better outcomes for their children, even if that results in worse outcomes for other children. And we can already observe this, as Terry said, um, in systems without formal school choice, um, more affluent families use their choice-making powers in ways that leave other people behind. Um, not only between schools, but even within schools. If you've been in a school, you're very aware of a school like the schools my children attend, which are very socioeconomically mixed. You're very aware of which parents go in to make sure their kids get the good teachers and which parents don't go in to make sure their kid parents get the good teachers. Um, that will be replicated in, in, a, in a full school choice system. Um, and England, I am not just some very pretentious person from Appleton, Wisconsin. I, I actually am English. Um, uh, and it has a countrywide school choice system, and I think you see this dynamic playing out there. It's had it since, well, since the early 19, uh, late 1980s. So you might say, as uh, um, Terry did, um, well, this dynamic already works through the housing market. So isn't it good to have school choice systems which open up school choice to poor families? And my answer to that is yes, sometimes. So let's talk about the Milwaukee voucher system for a little bit. It uh, used to provide vouchers only for low-income families to send their children to low-cost private schools if they were dissatisfied with their assigned public school. Now, my read of the research is that it's pretty unclear um, whether, on average, those schools have benefited poor children. But I have to say that the way I read the evidence, as an outsider, I find it hard to believe that they don't benefit those children. OK? Did you get the double negative? In other words, even though it's unclear, I, I think they probably do benefit the children who attend. Um, and certainly, as someone whose neighbors are mainly white, upper-middle-class families who chose their housing partly because of the quality of the local schools, I live about uh, 85 miles from Milwaukee, um, I'm embarrassed. Indeed, I'm actually somewhat ashamed to hear my liberal neighbors opposing a program which gives poor families of color a few miles away some fraction of the choice uh, that we have the privilege, privilege of enjoying. So I'm a cautious supporter, or at least I was a cautious supporter of the Milwaukee program. Now, the best argument, I've heard all the arguments that Terry went through against the Milwaukee program, um, as you can imagine, and I've had to valiantly you know, oppose them. The best argument that I would hear against it was from a friend, a very close friend of mine who's in the assembly, um, who would say, look, it's going to feed a bad political dynamic. There are two ways in which it feeds a bad political dynamic. First of all, it makes people think the problem is all about the schools and not at all about the conditions in which poor children live. And the second is, uh, yeah, um, you've got Tommy Thompson, our former governor, and you've got uh, um, the promoters of the Milwaukee voucher system, um, and they set it up, and it looks pretty good. But just you wait. Politicians will water it down. They'll make sure that... Um, Wealthier pet families can get access to it, and then the incentives will change so that the schools have less incentive to pay attention to and cater well for poor children, and they'll try to sort of cream off the top of the more affluent um, families. And that is exactly what uh, our Governor Walker did 
um, with, a, with a Republican legislature about, um, I don't know, time flies, like five years ago. Uh, he raised the cap, uh, the income cap, from 175% of the poverty level to 300% of the poverty level. Now, teaching children who are at 250% of the poverty level is a hell of a lot easier than teaching children who are 150% of the poverty level. And the voucher schools suddenly have an incentive to go for that demographic and not the, not the more disadvantaged demographic. Do I oppose the Milwaukee? I, I had to go back and forth a lot in thinking about the comments. Am I now opposed to the Milwaukee voucher system? No, probably not. But the dynamic is bad. And it's worth pointing out, as, as, as um, Terry did, that uh, vouchers only account for a very small part of the choice movement. Um, 2.5 million children are involved in charter schools. And in most of the 42 states, charter laws that have them, charter laws are not designed to uh, serve disadvantaged children in particular. Um, on average, it's true that they do serve more disadvantaged children on the whole. Um, but my read, for example, this is the, you know, the evidence is a, is a mix, right? So when I read the Credo uh, report, I'm less impressed than Terry is with the overall performance of charters. I am cognizant that some states uh, are not at all interested in serving disadvantaged kids, and uh, their charter laws and their charter design shows that and others are more interested in it. And of course, um, as an activist in any one of those states, I would be pressing, I would not be pressing right now to try and get rid of charters. That horse has sailed or something. Something has happened that isn't going to come back. Um, I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd be pushing for more regulation. And we have evidence that some charter schools, uh, and I'm going to single out the Knowledge is Power Program schools, KIPP, because we have very high quality, rigorous studies of KIPP schools, um, which do quite deliberately target low income students of colors in a, a color in urban areas, um, do benefit the children that attend them. The evidence is not so mixed on that, and it's pretty compelling. And again, if you read the evidence the way I do, I suspect that the, that the studies understate the benefit to those kids. However, um, we don't have much evidence at all on uh, the effect of KIPP schools or the Milwaukee voucher system on the schools that surround them. Um, uh, we do know that the most disadvantaged children and I, uh, families, and I'm not, this is not absolutely not a criticism of either program, but we do know that the most disadvantaged, the most disconnected children uh, are not taking uh, advantage of these programs. And they are concentrated into the traditional public schools which uh, um, other children are escaping. And it would be surprising to me if uh, that wasn't having some effect on the quality of education that the other children who remain in those schools are having. Um, when I talk to the authors of the, the, the KIPP studies, um, they, you know, they were interested in this, like, okay, let's really try and figure out how to, how to figure out what's going on with those other kids. Um, but they, you know, they didn't have, it wasn't, a research question of theirs. And there's some reason to believe that KIPP, for example, depends on it for its success on those children not attending. It also, and the voucher schools in Milwaukee also, have a business model that would be very hard to replicate at scale. They depend uh, heavily, in, in at least the voucher schools I know in Milwaukee do, and the KIPP schools, on um, early stage young teachers who don't have families who are willing to vote, devote many more hours than you should reasonably expect of teachers uh, given the kind of wages you're going to pay them later in their life uh, um, and uh, burning them out essentially. Again, that's not a criticism. That's not a reason not to have them. It's a reason not to think that you're going to get the benefits at scale. Um, okay, I want to uh, okay, say one more thing. Is that okay? Can I do two? All right, well, I, 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 will do, I will do two. So the first thing is, is just, look, uh, th this is a slightly orthogonal point, but, I do, but I've got a joke, and I also uh, want to make I actually think parents are pretty bad choosers, um, and I don't think that's because they're poor. Um, I agree with Terry that uh, lots of these parents are on it. They have their children's best interests at heart. Um, but I think it's incredibly hard to find out what's going on in schools. Um, if you have children, 
ask them what they learned today. So mine do two things. I've got, two, I've got two who are still in school. One of them says, not much, which I guess is true. Um, and the other one says, I say, what did you learn today? And he says, oh, I got so many yards and I took a catch and I had a handoff. I have no idea what he's talking about. Um, haven't got a clue. I assume it's math. Uh, but, you know, um, uh, now I'm being frivolous there, but it's really hard to get into it, to figure out what's really happening to your kid in the school unless the school's really bad. Even if the school's really bad, in order to make a choice in a way that is going to discipline the schools, you uh, have to figure out what would be going on with your kid in some other school. Not just any old other school, not a good school, but in the other schools that you have the choice of. And lots of times, even in a choice system, the various choices you have are all not very good. And when the schools are all not, you know, are all pretty similar to one another, it would be crazy to move your school for a kid from one school to another school. Even if the other school is a little bit better. We know that moving schools, especially mid-year, but even at the end of year, is bad, for, is bad for the kids' education. You do not want a system in which kids are moving all the time. Uh, as I always say to my friends who are, who are die-hard opponents of choice, the issue is not whether parents are bad choosers. The issue is whether ch parents are better choosers than the state. Right? And states vary a lot in how good they are as choosers. But we know um, that how, I am an American citizen, just to be clear. But what we know is that even the federal government and certainly many state governments have a long history of being bad choosers for poor children. And in particular, of being bad choosers for poor children who are not white. Um, uh, so. Um, I would, I would, in fact, tr trust the Swedish government with my children's education, uh, but I wouldn't trust the state of Mississippi. Um, so that explains my sympathy for programs, for choice programs that are designed directly to, 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 to target low income and otherwise disadvantaged children. But here's my final comment. Um, I think we should try to improve the choices government makes for poor children. And although many of the reforms, reforms that I would like to see are compatible with choice, um, I think that what choice, the arguments for choice often, not arguments for choice, but choice movements often um, distract attention from these other programs. So I like, let me go through very quickly. I welcome the Common Core State Standards as a mechanism that will help create an infrastructure to improve instructional, uh, instruction across all kinds of schools. We need better health and better mental health provision for poor families and children. We need better public health. We need uh, local reforms, stabilizing rental markets to reduce movement from schools caused by families having to change residence. I think we need more stable employment law. Um, uh, lots of children move school mid-year. Lots of children move school one or two or three times because their parents lose their jobs. Of course, partly because their parents weren't adequately educated in the first place, but partly because of the way the labor market works. Early childhood provision um, that better prepares low-income children to take advantage of school. Uh, categorical aids and state funding formulae that specifically target low-income children. Wisconsin still does not have a categorical aid of that in our, uh, like that in our funding formula. We've had, we've had vouchers since 1990, but nobody has introduced a categorical aid of that kind. Um, we need improved teacher training, which focuses more on instructional skills unless on what one elementary education student of mine who tragically regarded her philosophy classes as where she m learned her most useful practical teaching skills calls ideal theory, i.e. teaching teachers how things ought to be rather than teaching them how to teach the children that they'll actually uh, encounter. Reforms to open up the principalship to teachers who are more interested in student learning than in the success of the football team. Introduction of instructional coaches and directors of instruction in middle and high schools. How can a school be serious about learning if it has a director of athletics on a principal's contract and no director of instruction at all? We can talk about football later. Changes in the salary structure so that teachers are rewarded for their effectiveness 
and to reflect the difficulty of attracting talented teachers in certain subject areas, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we need those kinds of reforms. And uh, it's notable that in Wisconsin, uh, where, the, where the Republicans and a very pro-choice governor have had the uh, legislature for quite a while now, they have not implemented reforms like that. Um, they've not done anything about teacher education, which they could easily have done. They've not done anything about the principalship, which they could easily have done. And I worry that too much focus on choice takes the heat off uh, those kinds of um, reforms. All right, so thank you very much. And Professor Mo, for those uh, introductory remarks, you've given us a lot to think about and talk about. There's a lot of different issues we can get into here. One of the things I noted was that there seems to be a surprising uh, amount of agreement between the both of you on the goals by which school choice programs ought to be evaluated. Both of you put a great deal of emphasis on equity over, say, more traditional conservative concerns over liberty or parental control. Um, we might want to talk a little bit about what exactly we mean by equity, but uh, it struck me that if there's going to be disagreement between the two of you, it's going to be on what exactly this regulatory framework that ought to um, oversee a ideal school choice uh, system should look like. So maybe we could talk a little bit about what some of the specific regulations you'd like to see are. So for instance, um, you've already said that schools should not be allowed to reject any student who brings voucher dollars to that school. Uh, should parents be allowed to top off tuition dollars? So uh, you, you bring a $1,000 voucher to a private school and you also pay an additional $2,000 to cover the full cost of tuition. What kinds of restrictions ought states to place on the content or the teaching, teaching methodology of the schools in order to ensure quality? And do those regulations threaten to undermine the very autonomy of private schools that, in some people's minds, made them such an attractive option to begin with? So it's a lot of different questions, uh, but either one of you should feel free to take up um, any of these issues about the, the details of the regulatory framework that you'd like to see or would like not to see. I'll start. I'm, I'm really curious what you think. So I want to just go through, through a few things. This first is, I absolutely think that um, religious schools should not be excluded. And again, maybe, you know, this, my, my sympathy, I, I think I come off, and it's probably right, that I'm sort of more sympathetic to vouchers than I am to charters. And one of the reasons is that I think people should be able to get an education for their children with a spiritual dimension um, without having to pay for it. I mean, without having to pay too much for it, right? Um, uh, and the, you know, the Catholic school system used to do that, but the Catholic school system has found it harder and harder to do that. And the charters, the charter law, the charter regulations have actually induced former Catholic schools to become secular schools in order to be part of that. So that's one thing. Second thing, absolutely, I think that a voucher system should not include top-ups. The moment you include top-ups, you uh, allow parents, uh, allow schools to charge parents extra fees, you are playing an exclusionary game. So you, uh, you enhance the incentives of schools to uh, target the better off among the worse off, or even just the better off, right? Um, I'm a big fan of lotteries. I managed to convince uh, two school districts in the UK uh, to adopt modeled on the Milwaukee system to adopt lotteries in their school choice system. They lasted for about three years. They were really bad. For, somehow, in, in England, the, the word lottery um, seems to represent gambling in a way that is unacceptable, politically unacceptable. So um, I think that children should have to take the regular battery of um, uh, NAEP tests, etc. I think we need to be able to monitor what's happening. Um, Especially, I think, in a mixed in, in a mixed provision system, where you know, I'm not in favour of a complete voucher system all the way through. But if I were, I would think, okay, the good thing about that is that schools are just going to go out of business when nobody wants them. But in a mixed provision system, it's not going to be like that. And so you need to have, be able to monitor. Um, and I'm a big fan of the Common Core state standards, and I think that uh, testing around the Common Core state standards, uh, schools should be subject to that as well. Um, and I'd like to see the Common Core State Standards. I'd like to see it, it, it extended to other 
uh, subjects and literacy and numeracy. Um, but I think that leaves plenty of room for schools to really be quite, to differentiate themselves from one another, um, uh, including on, on the religious dimension. Anything there you disagree with? Not a lot. That's the thing. Um, you know, what, like, when I teach the politics of education and I talk to students about uh, charters and vouchers, there are always students who, who worry about these things. They worry about inequality and, and all, all the rest. Um, and, you know, my response is always, I think if the people in this room just sat down and talked about how we could come up with a framework that would address these kinds of concerns. I think we could do it, right? I think there's really substantial agreement about these things. You know, we want to hold schools accountable for their performance. The students have to be tested, right? Um, and I think that uh, schools need to be audited, right, to see how they spend the money. Right? Um, I think that um, uh, they need to be able to hire the kinds of teachers that they want to hire. And this is a matter of some contention because pe people seem to think that teacher accreditation is some kind of a, you know, it actually means something. Uh, and I think in many respects, uh, and certainly in many states, it doesn't mean anything. Right? If you can walk and chew gum, you can get accredited. Uh, Teach for America has done a good job. Right? And I think it, it's a good lesson uh, uh, for everybody because here they're hiring these, these uh, kids right out of college and putting them into very difficult uh, schools and they do just as well you know, and, and sometimes better than, than veteran teachers. Um, and what they add is tremendous flexibility uh, for, for these schools uh, when they're lo no longer in a straitjacket as to who they have to hire, and especially also when you get away from the seniority requirements and all the other things that tie principals and uh, district people in knots in putting the right teacher in the right place in regular public schools. Um, okay, a few other things. Top-ups. Um, I also am against top-ups, right? Because obviously if, if you give parents a $3,000 voucher and they have to add to it, who's going to add to it? People with money. I, most poor people don't have an extra, you know, four thousand dollars in order to get into a nice private school. Okay, that's not right. So the flip side of that is it's the government's job to make these vouchers big enough so that all parents can afford to go to those schools, to the typical private school in Indiana or Louisiana or wherever it is. And what's typically the case is the politicians don't do that. You know, they provide a voucher. You know, the, the, so the average spending in the public schools is $10,000 in the state. Uh, and they adopt a voucher plan. They'll have a voucher of $4,000. Oh, great. Right? That just means that if you just stick to the $4,000, you can only afford a $4,000 school. Right? What kind of school is that going to be? Right? So it's important to be all in, right, and, and make this thing work. Uh, but I think that it can work. If people are well-intentioned, if they, if they want to do what's best for children, if, if they're not thinking, I'm gonna, I hate choice, I'm going to sandbag this thing, right? I'm going to make sure that, that only X number of kids get vouchers, and the vouchers are too small to really do anything. They're just trying to sandbag the whole thing, and it happens all the time. But if you have people who just want to help kids, but they differ on you know, their concerns about inequality and all the rest, I think if they sat around and recognized government can do something about this, they can design a system that makes choice work the way we want it to work, I think there would be tremendous agreement. Can I, can I ask you a question? So one of the things that worries me, um, and it, it's very, I, I'm not a political scientist like you. I, I study my state because I live in it, right? But my state has been the sort of crucible of choice. So uh, since I lived immediately after I went there. Um, and one of the things that worries me is that the sophistication um, of your thinking about this is not reflected in the sophistication of the way pro-choice legislators think about it. Um, so, uh, the, I mean, there are exceptions, and I could, you know, I could name some in, 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 in uh, the Wisconsin legislature, 
But by and large, um, pro-vouchers, pro-charters, we're just in favour of markets. We're just in favour of... Uh, and and I, I think the reforms to the Milwaukee Voucher uh, Program reflect that. What's your experience been of talking with... And then, of course, you've got, on the other side, people who just want to sink it, so they don't, you know, Absolutely. they're not even doing this thinking. Right. Um, but what's your experience been of talking to legislators and, and being able to convince them to, you know, think, basically think better about it? Well, that's a lost cause. <laughs> and, and that's not a joke. Um, I, this is really a power game. And um, I, I think if you spend your life thinking, politicians are going to do the right thing, you'll always be disappointed. I think that uh, the, the people on uh, the right are uh, free market people uh, for the most part, and their ideal uh, in many cases is to uh, give parents money uh, to go private and to wish everyone good luck. End of story. And they are opposed to regulation. Regulations are bad. Government is bad. Right? People on the left, they just reflexively hate vouchers. And a big part of that is the unions hate vouchers. And many of the districts hate vouchers, right? And these are power groups, right? So a lot of this is driven by power and ideology and not by just regular people, well-intentioned people sitting around saying, you know, the schools aren't very good. You know, our kids are not getting educated the way we want them to be. How can we use choice to educate all the kids. No child gets left behind, right? Everybody gets educated. Let's come up with a framework that makes this work. And unfortunately, that is not the way politics works. And I don't have a solution for that. But I think it's really important for people to understand that, that this is not a problem that's intrinsic to choice. This is a problem that arises because our politics is the way that it is. And and the incentives built into politics are as they are. Well, I'll, I'll say, uh, uh, this is not supposed to be me interviewing you, but... Um, <laughs> uh, so I've got an, a, a, another question is really about unions. So when I, I, I should disclose, you know, my wife has been a um, high school teacher and, and union member and activist for a long time. 25 years. She doesn't look like she's old enough to have done that, but she has. Um, and uh, my, and, and I've got good friends who, I, I'm good friends with the president of the California Teachers Union, who actually brought me and my wife together, so I should just admit that. Um, but um, when I look at the, when I look at the, the, the way that unions interact with uh, school districts, they are very concerned about protecting their members, right? Obviously. Um, they resist reforms where they're not sure what the effect of the reform will be. They resist any reform which will give principals more power over their members. And I'm very sympathetic to that because I wouldn't want those principals to have power over me either. The particular, so I, I feel like, I mean, I feel like we're in this sort of situation, and maybe you think, you know, vouchers just sort of break out of this, but um, I, given the kinds of people who enter the principalship and the kinds, the principals have no power over teachers, therefore the kinds of people who occupy that position are the kind of people who wouldn't be able to exercise power over teachers well, and therefore teachers feel like, I don't want those people having power over me, because nor would you, Right. You know, I, and the, the so system I have much more you, sympathy. Than, you're describing the existing system. Yeah, yeah. No, I am. I am. Right. Yeah. So, so I would say that on average, in a charter school, a coach is not going to get to be the principal. You're not. Yeah. Gonna, oh, absolutely. Right. Yeah. I mean, these charters are floating on their own bottoms. They they have to be good, or they're going to fail. Right. And so the whole logic of how a charter school works, the incentives that drive it, are different from the existing system. Because all jobs in the existing system have been protected, insulated from performance concerns, right? you get this problem right, where teachers find that there's a principle over them that can judge them in perverse ways. right? And that principle can be right, um, a bad principle. Right? There are no consequences for those yeah. kinds of things. Yeah. In a charter school, there are consequences for making bad decisions like that. And that's what, that's what you want. 
I want to open things up to the audience here in just a moment, but before I do, just uh, want to be clear on the difference between various ways of implementing this idea of school choice. We've talked about the idea of school vouchers as one of the uh, uh, more, um, not common, but popular ideas behind the school choice movement, although the charter schools uh, you've both mentioned are actually more common in, in reality. Uh, we also have educational savings accounts. We have tax credit systems, all of which serve as some form of mechanism for providing uh, low income or maybe even middle income families with more choice in their educational services. What do you see as the respective advantages and disadvantages of these mechanisms for implementing choice? Do you think that one of them is the way to go or that the ideal system is going to be a mix of these different programs? I'm happy to answer if you yeah, go I'll first. Yeah, I'll answer. And then um, well, uh, I think that um, from a practical standpoint, uh, charters are the most likely means of spreading choice. Um, they're very popular. Uh, they've done well. Uh, I think that the deck is stacked against vouchers. Um, they have a very bad reputation. They're associated with right-wing conservatives and with free markets and so on. I think it's really sad that it's turned out that way, um, not because I have any sympathy for some of my right-wing friends, uh, but you know, because I, I, I think that uh, our country is filled with private schools. Um, and many of those private schools are more than happy uh, to take kids, especially disadvantaged kids, and educate them. And it is sad that we don't take advantage of all those schools and put them to use. Um, but I do think, and, you know, it's been a long time, right? It's been 30 years, and the voucher movement has not taken off, so I'm just being practical. So there's that. I think charter, charters are the, the growth industry, and um, that's where it's going to happen. Now, education savings accounts, so this is another thing that Republicans do. You know, that they, they think that everybody is like a CPA or something, right? And so yeah. they, they devise all these tax mechanisms. And, you know, yeah, everybody's going to have an education savings account, and they're going to be able to draw. And who's going to use that? You know, a large percentage of the population doesn't have a clue about how to use something like that or how to use the tax system, tax credits, to their own advantage. You know, and the, the people who need it most are the people who are the least likely to use it. The people who are most likely to use it are affluent. You know, and so that's why I think, you know, it has real potential. Uh, maybe if it were designed right, uh, but I don't have any faith in them to design it right. But I think charters are off on a good footing. Uh, they serve uh, a very large, disadvantaged and minority clientele. They're clustered in urban areas. They have a good performance record. And organizations like KIPP and Aspire and a number of other organizations have a lot of experience educating uh, disadvantaged kids and doing it really well. You know, I, I think this is on a good trajectory. And the only problem is that they're heavily opposed by the unions and the districts. I um, I share Terry's views about tax credits and, and savings accounts completely. Um, and uh, I think they end up, I mean, depending on depending on the rules around them, but lots of the rules around them are very generous to uh, people who are already affluent and have their kids in private schools, and it just basically gives them more money to send their kids to, you know, to, to spend on their kids in private schools. And I'm not, uh, I, I don't think that makes sense at all. I, the, I don't know whether I should, you know, so I, I think highly targeted, very generous and well-regulated voucher schemes is what I would want. I totally see Terry's point about, about that ship having sailed or whatever. It's not, it's not gonna, um, uh, it doesn't seem to go off, uh, off the ground. Um, people are much more at ease about charter schools. Um, people on the left are much more at ease with charter schools. Um, therefore, they're much more politically acceptable. But I'm, I'm basically a skeptic about charter schools. I agree, KIPP, Aspire, some, so there are some great charter management organizations. Um, there are some places where they've, it's, it's been really good, but lots of places where I, it, it hasn't really, many, many places, it hasn't really made the kind of difference that I want to see made, which is in the lives of disadvantaged children. Um, and I'll just say this again, I really worry that the 
saying, well, we need to, we absolutely do need to improve schools, but focusing too much on schools and pretending, so even people say, Finland, 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 Finland's great. Yeah, Finland has a 3% child poverty rate. I tell you what, American schools would be okay if we had a 3% child poverty rate. You know, we wouldn't be having this discussion. We wouldn't be saying America's great. Well, we would be saying America's great. We wouldn't say American schools are great. Um, uh, but, we'd be, but we wouldn't be in this. So child poverty is a serious problem, and it's a serious problem for any kind of school, voucher schools, charter schools, you name them. It's, it, we do not have anywhere in the world a technology which knows how to educate large swathes of children who are raised in heavy uh, uh, concentration of disadvantage. All right, so at this point, we will open up to uh, any questions from the audience. I'll kind of run around and bring you a mic if you just raise your hand and indicate that you've got a question to ask. Here in the stage here. I have a really simple starter question. As a person who's entirely new to this topic, how are charter schools funded? How are charter schools funded? Are they fully publicly funded, or are they like private? Is it like farming it out, like a private enterprise? So in technically, which it's so they're, they're fully pub well, they're publicly funded. Um, there are forty-two states; they all have different regulations. They're, they're, they're publicly funded. They're not allowed to charge top-ups. They have to admit by lottery um, if they're oversubscribed. So some some of the very schools? successful charter schools. Uh, are able to raise philanthropic funds, which enable them to do something different. Now, I think there's a limited supply of those kinds of funds, which so there's a scale issue. Um, but but some of them uh, do that. So my, I guess my question is, if they're effectively public schools as well, why are they? How is it that they're able to do better than what we call public schools? Or how's that? What's the? What are they? What what's the benefit added to them? I don't. Because they're not run by school boards and they're not run, they, they're not unionized. Oh, lots and, and of them are so, unionized. Huh? It depends on the state. Lots of them are unionized. Lots but, of them are. Yeah. Most of them are not. Yeah. About ten percent of them are unionized. Yeah. Yes, and so basically, the typical charter school is not unionized um, and runs itself, right? So the the people in the school make their own decisions about how to spend their budget, how to teach. Um, uh, who will teach, right, hiring and firing, how much people will be paid, all those decisions. And, you know, if you think about it in a slightly different way, uh, because they can make these choices, they can choose teachers who, like, agree with the mission of the school. And so they get there, and there's much more, it's much more likely that they will sort of be in agreement and be like a team. Um, and if somebody turns out to like hate the principal or not get along with colleagues, that person can be gotten rid of. Okay, in a public school, that's much more difficult, right? People have tenure, and you have people who like hate one another. They don't get along, right? It's just a complete mess, and everybody's there for the duration, right? And so you don't have a team there. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what tenure is all about, right? Um, but, you know, this is a very important thing, that it becomes a more organic unit. And schools ought to be like that. They're small, right? A, a school is, is inherently the kind of a unit that, that should function as a team. And, and, you know, teachers are constantly complaining in the public sector that they don't have enough power, that principals don't share power with them. Why should they? You know, people don't like one another. People don't get along well. They're, they're threats to one another. Where, in a charter school, they really are much more of a team. And in a team, principals have reason to share power with the people who are on their team because they trust them and they all have the same basic beliefs. Hello, and thank you for this debate. I really do appreciate being able to attend it. I have a question for each of you, for both of you. Um, I would like to know how many years each of you has taught in the K through 12 system somewhere, and how many years at whatever level, and what, at approximately what year did you leave the K through 12 teaching profession? I've never taught K through 12. Never? No. And, and, and okay, uh, I, I will make the same horrible admission. 
that I've never taught in the K through 12 system. But let me add something to it. Um, Milton Friedman and a number of other economists ha have won Nobel Prizes in economics. And uh, they won those prizes because they are able to understand how the whole economic system works. Right? And that's, that's their job, putting it all together right? and understanding what would make the economic system better, what makes it bad in some respect. Right? It's a systemic thing. Has Milton Friedman ever run a small business? Right? Has he ever run a dry cleaner? Something? No, he hasn't. It's a completely different kind of intellectual enterprise. And I don't think that people who study schools, and especially school systems, need to apologize for never having run, uh, run a classroom and taught third grade. I'm not suggesting that you apologize. On the other hand, I, I have taught pretty much everything pre-K. I skipped junior high and high school and then taught adults and for about half and half, a total of 46 years. I think teaching in one of these uh, for a year uh, in one of these needy schools in Southeast San Diego is where ours are located, would be eye-opening. Just, just my comment. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. I, 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 do a ton, I tend to agree with Dr. Bringhouse that often we're not debating the right issue when we're looking at something like this. Uh, I teach my students a maxim that goes that people with power will use their power to get around whatever limits you put on it. And no matter what you do to address the underlying income inequalities that, that have drove, driven this real debate really since the 1970s and 80s, prior to that you didn't have quite this much of a debate, you're never going to solve the issue. There's a good book out right now called uh, 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 Dream Hoarders, how the top 20% is rigged the system. So how do you account for the fact that no matter how you try to shuffle it to help those at the bottom of the system, the 20% of the top private schools, vouchers, charter schools, are going to figure out a way endowment funds, enrichment courses, club sports, to give their kids a categorical advantage coming out of it and maintain that advantage as they go through life? I'm happy to answer. Do you want to go first? Um, well, what you said is true. Um, the rich have advantages. And they will get what they want. Right? OK. Uh, the people at the top of our society have advantages. Um, uh, I think that it is the job of government to do something to help the people who are disadvantaged and who, who need help. And I think that. Uh, um, some things have been done so far. I mean, the federal government spends almost all of its uh, education funds on disadvantaged kids. That's a good thing. Uh, but we can design uh, education reforms in order to improve upon the education system that we have now. I, I think the way to look at this thing is not in terms of absolutes, like trying to turn poor people into Rockefellers. You know, it's not going to happen. What we need to do is to think about what is the baseline right now. And I think the baseline right now is really bad. It is trapping these kids. They have no way out. They are not getting educated. They, they can't get really good jobs. And so what we need to do is improve on that. And if we can't turn them into Rockefellers, and if the Rockefellers of the world continue to have advantages, we can't stop that. But we can help these kids improve upon the baseline. And I think that needs to be the goal of public policy. No, I, I, I just read Dream Hoarders three days ago. Um, so I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, and I, I, one of the things that's depressing about the book, and he knows it's depressing, is that it gets to the end. And well, what do we do about it? And he's got these sort of things that we should do about it, some of which he says we're not going to do. <laughs> and others of which, you know, are going to make a small difference. Um, and and he's focused, so it, if his focus is on the top 20%, and there are good reasons for that. Our focus is on the bottom 30%, right? I yes. mean, I think, I think that's all right. And, and 
And it's not, and of course, there's a competition between those two uh, groups. I, I think there's a competition. There's nothing, you know, there's no getting away from that. I don't see in, you know, the kind of time horizons I have, 20, 30 years, I don't see massive, massive structural reform dramatically equalizing things and leaving us with a child poverty rate of like Finland's. Okay, I might be wrong. I mean, goodness knows I've been wrong about loads of things in the last two or three years. So, you know, I, and I'd love to be wrong, but I don't see that. So because of that, I think of reform as being about sh shifting things in, you know, incremental ways that may not be hugely noticeable. I, I have a friend who, who works in Santa Cruz. And she works as a, she worked for a while as a, as a mentor to new teachers. And she would say to me every now and then, she'd say, oh, you know, I, what am I doing? Is this any use? I said, look, are you improving the quality of their teaching by 2%? Yeah. Okay, so you're improving it by 2%. How long do you think that that, that, that cadre of 20 teachers are going to be in the profession um, between them? She says, oh, you know, adding it all up, maybe you know, 120 years. So that's 2% improvement for 120 years of work. Like that's a pretty, pretty big improvement. It's not revolutionary, but that justifies you doing your job, right? And so I sort of think of, I think of improvements in that, kind of, in that kind of way. And it's always a struggle. And, you know, you, 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 win, you win some and you lose some. Um, so, okay. I'm going to work out. I don't need a mic, but... Uh... <laughs> uh, hello, my name is Michael Swiss. I really uh, admire the arguments you guys are both making towards school choice, but what really appeals to me the most about school choice is that sense of competition. So schools competing for their students the same way that businesses compete for customers. Now, my question is, the more and more regulation we add to this school choice system, it seems that we're taking away from that sense of competition between schools. Now, how much do you think, for provoking you a question, how much regulation do you think uh, needs to be added without taking away from the effectiveness of the competition between these schools? Well, I'm happy to answer that. Um, <clears throat> I think that striking the right balance is the key to the whole thing. I think your question is an excellent one. And it, it's also one that nations have faced in their economies. You know, like the United States has a different balance between uh, regulation and markets uh, than Sweden does, right? Um, and part of it is a, a reflection of what society wants, you know, what they want to do uh, for their citizens. Um, um, so uh, anyway, I, I, I don't think there's any right answer, but I do think that, that when it comes to education, there are certain basic things that need to be there. You know, I think if it, it, you don't want to go to the extreme. You don't want to just say, okay, we're going to give people money and they can go private. We're going to create these charter schools and they can do whatever they want. You know, because guaranteed they will do bad things. People will steal the money. That's not a joke. They steal money all the time. Right? They need to be audited. Right? People need to go to jail. Uh, schools need to be closed down. Okay, so these are basic rules. Right? We need to have accountability rules to make sure they teach kids what they're supposed to know. Um, uh, we need to have rules that make sure that if schools don't perform, they're shut down. Right? And so you sort of go down the list, but what you don't want to do is constrain them to the point where they look just like the public schools used to look. Like, I don't think you should say, okay, you have to have a union. You have to be unionized. You have to have a collective bargaining contract, right? And then it turns out they've got seniority provisions and all these other things, right? So I think that you need to recognize that autonomy is really valuable. And local decision making by people who are right there on the school site is really valuable. And then you have to have an overarching framework because you can't just let them do anything they want to do, right? They owe it to society and to those kids to teach them certain things, 
and not to steal the money and all the rest, right? So it has to be a balance, but I think the autonomy part needs to be preserved. And I think in the, in the regular public schools, it hasn't been. I think they're buried, and, and that's a part of the problem. I would add to that. You have to regulate schools that receive public money. I, I think we should regulate public schools like this so that they cannot choose their own students. Because if they can choose their own students, they are all going to compete for the students who are easiest to teach. And the students who are easiest to teach are the students who are the least needy and who teaching whom contributes the least to our social pool of human capital. You have to make sure that schools have an incentive and have the means, whether they're public schools or whatever, um, to uh, educate all comers and in particular to, tr to educate well the least advantaged students. Um, and there's no, a, a pure sort of competitive market system is not going to do that. It's, it, 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 won't, it won't create the incentive for them to do that. I think we have time for about two more questions. Uh, before I hand it off to the next person, though, I just wanted to note that there is a link on the slide, barely legible up there, uh, with, a, uh, with a link to a survey um, that uh, I'd be very grateful if you could fill out, just telling us what you thought about tonight's event uh, at some point. You know, please. Hi, so we've been talking a lot about minorities tonight and how minorities are disadvantaged a lot, especially in the school system. And um, I think Native Americans, uh, tribal peoples, are a perfect example of these minorities that are disadvantaged. And a lot of the time on reservations, there's one school for a tiny amount of kids. And the school is bad, and these kids are undereducated because we don't have good teachers in the school. But for a lot of tribes, as soon as uh, people step off of the re reservation, they're not part of the tribe anymore. So what's the plan with school choice for this? <laughs> Are you going to establish six charter schools on one reservation for 100 kids so they can choose? Or are you going to leave them to stay with the same bad schools that they have now and continue to stay undereducated? So I'm the anti-choice person, the sort of roughly anti-choice person. So it's easier for me to respond to this. I, I don't think that people who support school choice, vouchers, charters, really think of them as any kind of uh, central solution to poor schooling in rural areas. Poor, you know, low quality schooling in rural areas is not going to be solved um, by markets because of the, because of the features of, of, of rural areas. You can only have, there are, a lot, there are lots of areas in Wisconsin where really, at best, unless we develop amazing distance technologies that we haven't done, at best, you're only going to have one or two choices. Um, uh, I th it's primarily an urban school. You know, it's a prim pr primarily a proposal for urban and, to some extent, suburban. Uh, uh, and I don't have a, and I don't have an answer for rural schools, um, except sort of boring ones like. Um, uh, for giving loans or, you know, having higher pay to induce teachers to go and work in them. Um, I don't, you know, I, with the tribes, I don't know what to do. It, you know, I, I, I do not think you should have to, you know, I, I want the best teachers in the schools for disadvantaged kids. I don't care. They don't have to be same race. They don't have to be same ethnicity. They don't have to be same tribe. And if a tribe insists on that, I, I don't know what to say about that. Um, but they want we you need them well paid, you need them well trained, et cetera. So I, I just don't think I, I don't think the choice people think this is a solution for that problem. But maybe Terry does. No, I don't. I, I, I actually think that uh, this is a real problem. Mm -hmm. um, uh, choice is obviously uh, uh, best suited for urban areas. Uh, and the more rural the area, uh, and sparsely populated, the more difficult it is to, to use choice. That's a sad thing, uh, but I think it's a true thing. Um, uh, that doesn't mean that we can't do anything as a society for those areas, because uh, as he said, um, you know, one solution would be, I mean, you can imagine a state legislature or the federal government saying, all right, we're going to do something about those schools. We're going to pay teachers and principals five times as much or 10 times as much to go there, you'd, sign, you'd find really, really good people signing up to do that, right? And so there are ways 
uh, to attack this problem. And, and just one other thing, it's, it's not just reservations, it's also like rural areas in general. And one of the things that nobody studies, and maybe there are these people here who would like to study this, is uh, uh, the power of school districts over state legislatures. And uh, uh, rural districts, I mean, have you ever asked yourself, why aren't there more charter schools yeah. in choice in the South? Okay, there's a good reason for that. And I think it's that these legislators are very dependent on sort of local notables, the people who control politics in rural areas. And they don't, they don't want to be interfered with. Right? They want to keep doing things the way they've done them. And so the word for the legislature is, you leave us alone. And it becomes a power thing. And so improving schools in rural areas becomes very difficult because they don't want to be messed with. Yeah, I, I mean, I think just a, a small confirmation of that. In Wisconsin, um, the people who mainly vote for vouchers and charters are Republicans. The districts in which vouchers and charters occur are mostly Democratic districts. Um, Republicans, by and large, don't want them in their own districts. But for lots of reasons, including this. All right, one last question, please. It's a big one. Um, hi, my name is Viet Mai, and I've been working in education for 17 years. I know it looks not like that, but um, <laughs> I, I'm a new student at the, the, the Croc School uh, for the Master's in Social Innovation Program. Um, my question is kind of taking a step back from the discussion around, uh, I guess, the schools and, and, and looking at more of like the, the neighborhood climates. Um, and I noticed you, 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 you put a lot of emphasis on uh, performance being uh, a measure of a school's success. Um, however, a study by the San Diego County Office of Education showed that only 25% of seventh graders in San Diego County actually go on to complete their college education. Uh, which leaves basically 75% who drop out somewhere along the way between seventh grade and, and higher ed. Uh, which leaves me to wonder, is our education system uh, measuring the right performance indicators? Like what are we, what are we actually measuring? What are we uh, expected for students to learn? Um, and do you see any of that changing? Because I think in my, in my observations, we only change the measure of how they um, are, 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 we only change how we measure their performance. We don't change the indicators that determine success, uh, which also may play a part on the larger issue that our students aren't actually going on to higher ed to complete, but they're kind of just disappearing into the system. Um, and once we do remove a student out of their own home neighborhood, what is this message that we're sending the community? That their school and their neighborhood isn't worth attending? Um, and that you know their solutions are outside of their community, and then how do we provide the the so additional support needed for the culture clash that happens? Because I work with a lot of uh, I, I've even done work at La Jolla Country Day, and even uh, know students that go to the Poi School uh, up in La Jolla, but they come from City Heights, southeastern San Diego, and there's still that culture clash where teachers and their peers. They're, un they're unaware of the social economic climates that they have to go to at home every single night, and they're not sensitive to those issues. So we're still dealing with the issue of poverty, um, poor, poor living conditions that don't even allow for a student to succeed in, in a such set environment. You want to address that? I mean, I, I'm happy to talk about it, but this is one of your central things. Yeah, well, so I, I don't, I don't think we should, I think it's cruel to say schools can fix all this, right? You have very high rates of poverty, you have high rates of unemployment, you have swathes of families without health care, you know, more, fewer without health care now than in the past and maybe in the future. Um, uh, poor mental health provision, you know, even mental, even for the upper 25% mental health provision isn't that great. For the bottom 30%, it's really poor. Families under serious stress, stress is toxic. Stress undermines learning. It undermines your ability to learn. And to say, oh, well, 
schools can fix all that. We just need to get the right kind of schools or whatever. That is, that, that's cruel and it's a recipe for burnout and it's a recipe for you know, not, not moving forward. Um, so we need to change the conditions people live in. That said, Terry thinks, and I agree with him, uh, that schools make some difference. So saying schools can make all the difference, that's a mistake. Saying schools can make no difference, that's a mistake too. Schools can make some difference. And whatever difference it, they can make, we have an obligation to try and figure out how to get them to make that much difference, right? Um, and one way is, you know, so various choice proposals, but all sorts of other proposals. Um, paying teachers more for, to put, well, you know, Terry came, you know, paying teachers a lot more um, to teach poor kids than to teach more affluent kids. Um, uh, I'll make my revolutionary proposal here now. Privatize high school and middle school athletics, right? So I'm, I don't even think the government should pay for training uh, NFL players, but if it's going to, um, let it do it outside the school so that um, uh, APs and principals don't have their time wasted. Uh, by um, all the things they have their time wasted by. So those kind of, you know, there are, there are lots of things we could do to make schools more effective. And whatever, whatever we can do, we should do it. Yeah, I'll just add to that. And this is a great question. It's a big think question about society. Um, it's well known that the social conditions uh, that surround students uh, have more to do with their performance and not just academically, but also with whether they graduate and whether they go to college and how much they earn later on uh, than their school does. OK, uh, so, so then what? Uh, well, one solution, I put it in quotes, um, and this is what the people who defend the current education system uh, say, is, well, uh, education reform needs to focus on poverty and everything associated with poverty and uh, uh, do away with poverty. OK, good luck with that. Yeah. Right? This is, a, this is an intractable problem that government has been dealing with forever, very ineffectively, unfortunately. But if you lay this on education reformers, what it really means is that their plate is going to be so full that they will never improve the schools. And in fact, the people who say that are essentially saying it to distract from the fact that they can't improve the schools without fundamentally changing them, which they have no intention of doing. Right? And so what I would say is that we have to be humble about this as education reformers and say, look, we agree that most of this is social. So somebody, the government, society, needs to do something about that, get serious about it, like healthcare reform and all the rest. But the, the challenge of education reform is to improve the schools so that the schools can do their part in taking kids, however disadvantaged they are, and educating them as best they can. And that's what KIPP and Aspire and these other organ rocket ship and these other organizations are doing very effectively. You know, a lot of, a lot of educators just threw up their hands and said, well, these kids are too disadvantaged. We can't teach them. And Kip said, oh, yeah, we can. And those kids are going to college. Those kids are learning something. Now, there's still the poverty issue that needs to be dealt with. But if you lay that on education reformers, I think it just cripples education reform. So changing civic culture, like changing the education system in a country, is a big task. But I think if we've added 1%, 2% difference to the quality of the nation's conversation about educational policy tonight, we've done our job. Thanks to all of you for coming out. Thank you, President Harris. Thank you, Marilyn Burnham. And most of all, thank you to our two debaters, Professor Moe and Professor Bighouse, for a wonderful conversation.